It's 2022, is this the best gravel bike for the money? Today, I'm gonna to take a look at the Salsa Journeyer, find out what I like and dislike about it in this video. This isn't the first time I've looked at this bike from Salsa. Previously, it was called the Journeyman. It has been rebranded to Journeyer, but beyond the name change, since the last time I've looked at it, there have been some interesting geometry as well as build changes. First off, the frame is T6 aluminum, and in the front, you get the wax wing fork. So this is a carbon fork with an aluminum steerer. This particular build was built around 700 by 38 millimeter tires in the form of the Terraville washburns. The line as a whole is still multi-wheel size. There are models that ship with 650B and it does still maintain the clearance for 650B by 2.25. So a lot of meats you can put in this bike. It's actually kind of comical when you look at the fork and the rear, just how much clearance there is with these skinny 700 by 38s. One big change is the bike is now through axle the last one I reviewed was quick release, which gave some people some pause, but they've since upgraded it to thoroughly modern standards, as well as flat mount disc brakes. These are some Tektro mechanical disc brakes. Moving up to the top, the controls are SRAM Apex. Good, reliable, doesn't break the bank, and has a nice, comfortable, smallish hoods. The handlebars are the Salsa Cowbell. And before we move on to the drivetrain, let's talk about the mounts because it's got all the mounts. Three pack mounts on the fork as well as eyelets for fenders. You've got mounts on the bottom of the down tube, as well as three pack mounts for a water bottle cage so you can move it up and down, as well as some auxiliary mounts up here. Not quite big enough to put a, a water bottle cage in the smaller size, but if you had a custom frame bag, you could use those as mounting points. And in the rear, it has mounts for a rear rack. So a lot of utility with this bike. So moving on to the cranks, this particular build is one by with Apex One cranks. 40 tooth chain ring. As a side note, there are multiple builds with this bike. Some use Advent, some use Shimano. So depending on your price range and your wants and needs, you probably find the drivetrain you want. In the rear, all Apex, 11 speed, 11 to 42 tooth on the rear cassette. Decent gearing, it's more like compact road equivalent gearing. For me, if you really wanted to take this on a really mountainous bike packing terrain, the gearing would probably be the first thing I'd change definitely to some kind of budget mullet setup, because as it is, it's just barely smaller than one-to-one. -one. Another nice feature about this bike is the nice sloping top tube. If you wanna take it on some trails, plenty of room to run a dropper post. As you see it with the pedals and the bottle cage, weighs in at 23 pounds, which is pretty dang good. That is probably one of the big upsides with aluminum is you can get the weight down a little bit more. I think an equivalent bike to this would be something like the Space Horse and that would generally weigh in the mid 20s to upper 20s. So pretty interesting that you can get a lighter bike for a lot less. And I know some of you are gonna poo poo uh, aluminum. They should just be used for, for beer cans. But here's the thing. I think aluminum has gotten a bad rap. I think with the advent of the gravel bike, you're running a lot more tire, a lot more natural suspension, and that counteracts a lot of that difference you would feel with aluminum. Okay, so aside from the quick release to through axle and, and flat mount disc brake uh, changes, there have been some pretty significant geometry changes as well. On In the front end, the bike has gotten slacker at 69.5. And it's 69.5 throughout the size range, not just because it is a smaller bike. With that slackening of the head tube, I think it's it, it definitely moves further away from the uh, more cross-inspired, road-inspired gravel bikes, and is and is planting its feet firmly in that adventure bike land, if you will. With with the 69 and a half head tube angle, 50 millimeter fork offset, and this tire size, it's a fairly high trail bike at 79. I know some of you, your your eyes are glossing over. I will talk about what that translates to in ride feel in just a second. Another big change is the rear end. They actually made it a little bit longer. It's now 440, which when you compare it to a gravel race bike is is pretty dang long. And by now you're probably wondering, Russ, what do what do all the maths mean? I thought you were a literature major. Do some literature fying. So what all that translates to, the bike is extremely stable. It wants to hold its line and generally just plow through stuff. It's gonna be pretty unperturbed by the terrain 
and won't get redirected easily as opposed to a more cross inspired or road inspired gravel bike. Another thing I noticed about this bike is that it's a pretty smooth accelerator. When you put some heat on pedals, it doesn't accelerate in like herky-jerky movements, but long, smooth accelerations. I'm not saying it goes faster or slower, but how it gets to speed is different from a cross slash road inspired gravel bike. Going uphill, the bike is a even tempo climber. Again, not jumpy, just smoothly and evenly will get you up the hill. I, I will say the high trail and you know, I usually ride 650B, so much smaller overall diameter. And this wheel and tire combination, to me, felt like it wandered a little bit on the road. Not, not a whole lot, but coming off of the bike like the Soma Grand Randonneur or the Crest Lightning Bolt, which are, which are decidedly low trail. If you ride those back to back, that's kind of the sensation you'll get with this bike. All right, so going downhill, I think this is where this bike really shines. The higher trail, the longer wheelbase, the long chainstay. It just makes for a super comfortable and predictable descender, even on the chonky stuff. If you hit a baby head or other sized rocks smaller than an infant's head, it's not, it's not gonna slap you around. You're just gonna keep going straight. Wherever you point the bike, it's, it's just gonna go there. So, so overall, if I were to describe the ride, it's definitely stable, predictable, comfortable, not too spicy, but you know, again, not everyone's looking for that. I think it would be a great bike for those long epic day rides, even for gravel events where you're not at the pointy end of the race, but want something smooth to help you endure those endurance race things. Also, since it maintains all the mounts, I think it would make a great bike commuter during the week. Take off those racks and ride the grab grab on the weekend. So to wrap it all up, I think the previous version of uh, the Journeyer that I reviewed a couple years ago slotted itself between the Warbird and the Cutthroat. This iteration with the slacker head tube angle, the longer rear end, definitely shuffles over more to the Cutthroat territory. In some ways, I would view this bike as a Cutthroat light. When you look at it that way, it's an interesting proposition because the Cutthroat's gotten considerably more expensive, but this gets you a similar-ish bike that also doesn't weigh a ton and won't lighten your wallet. So if you're looking for that adventure bike that won't break the bank and will leave you some money to, act, to actually go on an adventure, then this bike is definitely one to check out. Again, different price ranges. I think this one MSRP is about $1,800, but you can, but there are builds with them closer to $1,000. So that's why I think, what do you guys think of the new, new Journeyer? Is it a bike that you're interested in? Let me know in the comments below. And hey, if you guys like this video, check out the merch store. We just got some brand new patches, our unserious cyclist patches, or better yet, join us on Patreon. And as always, everybody, keep the supple side down.